Hey, Monique, it's great to have you on the show. The audience may not know it, but I'm going to mention to them that you you were actually my coach, and uh, we haven't talked about this previously, but I want to start working with you again, probably in July and August. So oh, um, can't wait. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, and you know, I thought you were fantastic, and we just got started, and then this COVID thing hit. So anyway, please let people know why you're so incredible based on your background and what you're doing today. Will you please? <laughs> Well, how do I answer that question? Goodness gracious. Well, uh, my name is Monique and I have had a wonderful opportunity and wonderful experiences in my life to have lots of wonderful jobs. I was, I came out of the womb very type A, very logistically oriented. My family was very much like that. Um, I was, I was taught and trained from a very young age on how to uh, be logistically oriented, how to organize things, how to put things into not only uh, an order, but how to see patterns. And so throughout my career, throughout about all the different jobs that I've had as an event planner. Uh, I own my own moving and organizing business for a very long time. And then the last decade of my life was spent helping Simon Sinek uh, build and create his movement, uh, the Start With Why movement. Uh, I started with him very early on in, in 2011 and have been with him, like I said, for the last almost decade. And throughout all of these experiences, I've uh, been had the opportunity to be around people that are not like me. You know, the, one of the joys of being a type A is, is you're always paired with a visionary. You know, the details always paired with the visionary person so that we can help bring their ideas to life. So I've had the experience of working with lots of different personality types and lots of different jobs and different industries. And I've been able to see patterns that can help people grow as individuals as well as grow their partnerships. Awesome. Well, I work with you as a speech coach, you know, type of thing. Why don't you talk a little bit about that first? And then I'm really interested in really your unique niche in coaching as far as how to work with an executive assistant or how to hire them, how to find them, that type of thing. Because nobody trains that at all. No, they don't, uh, which is amazing to hear because there's so many CEOs. I mean, there's millions and millions of CEOs in this country and every single CEO has an executive assistant. <laughs> But yet we're never trained on how to do this. So, uh, but first, so yes, you know, one of the, one of the pieces of my business is the coaching business and I do coach a lot of speakers and that's in very different ranges. I have lots of speakers who are just starting their speaking career. How do I build my keynote? How do I build my speaker packet? I need a speaker video. How do I market myself? How do I differentiate myself? Uh, sort of the, the beginning stages of wanting to go out and become an orator. Uh, I have a few clients that are somewhere in the middle. Maybe they've been doing this for a year, two years, four years, and they're ready to get to their next evolution, whether that's, I want to get to the next tier. Uh, I charge now $5,000 for my speeches and I want to go to 10, or I've charged 1,000 and I want to go to five, sort of that next evolution of their business. And then I do work with a few speakers who have been doing this for five, 10, 20 years, and again, are trying to launch something new. I, I call it getting to your next evolution. That could be launching a book, that could be launching a new product, that could be turning your live content into online content, which is a big thing these days. Um, if you are a B2B and you wanna to go to B2C, things like that. I, I help people get to their next level by creating a process and a procedure with them to help them do it forever. And obviously, a lot of my training came from working with the best of the best of the best for the last decade. Um, that's, that's what I did with him, was help him go from where he was to having the movement that he's got right now. And what is the process behind that? How does that happen? Yeah, and probably not using Simon as an example, but maybe someone else as an example. If, if I was, I mean, I came to you because I have been speaking for a long time, you know, 10, 15 years wanted to really up my game. I wanted to take it to where I could, you know, do the TED talk and really do a major keynote. I think the most people mm -hmm. I've spoken in front of are 800, maybe a thousand people, but really do a major one. And I still want to come back and do that with you. And I'm very confident. I think you have a unique skill set. It's going to be awesome. But maybe you can talk about this person who's, let's, let's start with a person who really hasn't done a lot of talks. They are a leader of an organization. Mm -hmm. And now for whatever reason, they're thinking, okay, I need to start talking in front of groups better. Maybe it's just their growing organization that they mm -hmm. need to do better, but maybe it's outside of that. Mm -hmm. What are some of the considerations there that 
they should be thinking of if they want to take that step? Sure. I mean, first and foremost is what's, what's your purpose? What's your why? Why are you doing what you're doing? And what is it that you need to bring to life? That is absolutely the foundation for anything else moving forward. If you're not clear on what you have to give, the strengths and the skill set that you own um, within the subject matter that you're speaking, about and then how do you put your personality who you are inside and outside and then take the subject matter that you have and how do you put that together and deliver that in a unique way that's engaging and entertaining um, and and will help people continue to lean into you so it is uh, the first step with anything is you have to know who you are as an individual you really have to be comfortable with what your purpose is in the world and then we identify what is the topic um, and, and how is that different from anyone else who might be speaking about that topic? How do you differentiate yourself? What are the, the little nuances that you bring to the table that somebody else doesn't bring to the table? How can we make this uniquely yours? And then it's building that. Uh, the, the structure to building a keynote is one thing. The structure to delivering a keynote is, is a different thing. It's, you know, you can have a great speech but if you don't know how to deliver it in a manner that helps people lean in, um, it's just going to be one probably great speech. So it's the combination of building up your own skill set and your your skill in, in how to orate appropriately and then how to build the actual keynote that is, is, is a complete um, representation of who you are. Okay. So can you give an idea to our audience before we move on to the other subject, which is really interesting to me, of how you work with people, kind of what are the phases? I know that when I came to you, I had a talk. We wanted to work on my hiring talk because that was unique. And as much as I've done that hiring talk for at least 12 years, so, or a similar one, I mean, you really started taking it apart and pushing it back. And in some ways, I felt like I was starting from scratch in a positive way. Mm -hmm. But as an outsider coming in, doing that type of coaching and helping people work on it, what, what are kind of the phases someone should expect? And, and you know, I'm, I'm telling the audience here, I'm bringing you on because I believe in you. I'm, I'm, I said at the beginning, I want to work with you again to finalize our work. Um, what should they expect that that's going to look like phase by phase? And what are kind of the big, maybe you have some examples of there was, somebody was here and then we hit this phase and phew, they went way off the charts. Sure. So my coaching is very in, um, interpersonal. I work directly with the the speaker on the other end. And, and first, I need to identify what your goals are. Just as you said, you had a speech and you wanted to um, improve on it. You wanted to make a better version of that speech. So I would work with you directly on doing that. I have some speakers who are literally building their keynote for the first time and just have never had a keynote. So we work together. The, the first phase is always, who are you? What is your purpose? Where do you stand in the world? What are you, what is your strength set? Um, what, what do you have that you stand strong in? And so we work on that first. Then we really dive into what your goals are, uh, what you're trying to accomplish both this month, this year, and in five years and in 10 years. And I build a very uh, specific plan, like what what is happening with you in five years so that we can build the machine to get there. Uh, and then we build the machine basically for whatever, whatever it is you're trying to get to. So if it's the keynote, uh, you know, in that first phase, I would help you again, build your keynote structure that help you deliver it. What are the, the, the speaking techniques that one would need on how to deliver how, you know, not pacing. What do you do with your arms? How do you actually deliver this um, in person? What are you doing with your face? things like that, that people don't really think of, these nonverbal clues that we give off all the time. And we're giving this off to a large audience and how do you uh, control that and, and do what you need to do with that. And then it's, it's how do you build your speaking machines? So there's all kinds of components behind just being a speaker. There's a hundred things that have to happen before you take stage. It's you know, sending in contracts, sending in your speaker reel. What does your bio say? What are your headshots? How many headshots do you have? Do you need new headshots? Um, session descriptions. Where are they? Do you have a website? There's lots of, of juicy bits to the machine that we have to build before you actually take stage for the first time. 
So that's sort of phase one. Uh, then we can take it from there. I, uh, the, the second phase, like you said, there's speakers that I work with that have been doing this five, 10-ish years, somewhere in the middle. And they either want to improve and have a better version or they want to build another keynote. So I was talking about cars. Now I want to talk about boats. Uh, so how do I create this keynote about boats and how do we take what I've already done here and, and translate it into that? Or it's how do you take that to an online medium, which is I think something that's happening a lot these days, which is a very different way of, of speaking. Uh, speaking to a computer in this sort of format it, it, it is not, and I want to say this very plainly, you don't deliver a keynote online the way you deliver a keynote live. There's a thousand things you have to do in between because you're only getting, you know, this much of someone <laughs> where on a stage you can use your hands, you can show energy, and you can't do that through this sort of medium. So how do you bring that to a medium? How do you bring it online? Um, and then again, phase three is usually I work with speakers on launching a book, launching a product, uh, or launching multiple books, I should say, new courses. Um, I work with one client right now who just wanted to go from more of the B2B model to the B2C model and start a movement, if you will, have more of the, the collective uh, join in his community and build a community where he can share his messages for, for the long term. Um, so those are sort of the, the three major buckets that I work in. But again, it's really unique to the type of person that I'm working with. Because how I would work with a corporate CEO is different than how I would work with a teacher, for example, um, just because yeah. there's different skill sets that are behind that. Yeah. And you mentioned the photo piece and in your photos, people should look online at your photos. You have some of the greatest photos, a lot of high energy mm -hmm. Nice looks. You, you, I think you recommended a photographer that you did or whatever, and I don't mm. know whether that's where all they come from, but you do a great job all with of your them. photos. Yeah. Pete Longworth yeah. is, uh, and I'm happy to give him a shout out. Pete Longworth, uh, his website is the, the art of seeing life, the art of seeing life. And he is a brilliant photographer and videographer. Um, you know, he, he knows how to bring out your personality through a picture. Well, that's great. And just for the audience, since they're hearing that website, what's your website for everybody? MoniqueHellstrom.com. Okay. Yeah. Easy. So, okay. The other, uh, one last question on this before I move on is, so let's say I'm a person who wants, it falls in one of those three buckets. Um, how long is a typical engagement? With me? Yeah. I usually start around three months. Um, I don't like to do one-offs and two-offs solely because uh, my goal is to help you be the best version of yourself and give you what you need. And there's just no way to do that in one or two calls. I do have a few speakers that are like, look, I've got this all taken care of. I just need one, one hour session with you. No, no, you don't just need one hour session with me. We need longer than that. Uh, because it is detailed. You have to get in, you get into the meat and potatoes of it. So I generally yeah. start with a three month commitment generally. Uh, but that can, I've worked with some speakers for years. Yeah. I mean, I, w I was thinking you and I would work together for a long time. It wouldn't, it would easily be close to a year, maybe multiple years. So that's what I would expect too. Well, let's shift gears here. I'm, that's unique. We haven't had somebody on the show yet who coaches speakers, but this other piece of the puzzle, as you mentioned, there's a, I don't know what are there. There's at least probably tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of executive assistants or assistants. 4 million but, in the United States. Okay, 4 million. There we go. But there's no training. And, and, you know, people get thrown in the job. And so often I hear, particularly from entrepreneurs, who receive no training themselves before they started their business, right, on how to be a leader. And that's why they've gotten me in. But they're like, I, you know, I, I really feel my assistant could be doing more. Mm -hmm. And yet there's so many components to that. Where do you want to dive in on this? Because when you work in this area, are you coaching the assistant or are you coaching the boss? Or are you coaching both? Both. I, okay. I want to coach both. Uh, so where, where does all stem from? You know, uh, there is a, a huge lack of uh, human training in business these days. When you take a business course or go to school for business, there's not one course that's how to work with human people. And the last time I checked, all companies were made up of human people. So there is little to no training on how you do that anyway, let alone people that have very different skill sets than you do. 
And so, so that's missing. And then when you really drill it down, there's certainly no training on this very personal partnership between an executive assistant and their visionary and their executive um, where, I mean, this executive assistant is going to know everything about you. They're going to know how much money you have in your bank account and when you're fighting with your partner. Like we know everything about you and how do you not only have a relationship with the human, but this very personal, close relationship with someone who is there to support you, but is a completely different personality set than you. Different skills, different personality. They're usually detail oriented. Everything is in bullet points. And yet we're working with someone who speaks in, you know, one person's above the forest flying over it and one person's walking through. So it's, it's a challenge and it's a challenge for everyone. And I feel for executives because they've, they've never had this, you know, one, they get promoted and promoted and promoted. And one day somebody says, congratulations, you got that C in your title. Here's the corner office. Here's use of the barista coffee machine. Oh, and here's Linda. She's going to know everything about you. Go. And you're like, what do I do with Linda? Who is this person? How do I give her things? What do I not give her? What's too much? What's too little? How do I speak with her without sounding like a dictator? Like this is just never talked about. So I want to bring this to light and I want to have this conversation at least be started, whether I'm a part of the conversation or not, I don't care. What I want to happen is this conversation to start. This is one of the most important relationships you can have as an entrepreneur, especially when you're building a new business. Your executive assistant could be the key to you doing more with what you've got if you know how to use him or her appropriately. So I would love to be able to go in and, and train both sides of the, of the coin so that they can work together um, in a partnership. When I only get to coach one, it's almost like only one partner is going to marriage counseling. You know, the, the, the wife's going to marriage counseling and the husband is not going to marriage counseling. So there's going to be a disconnect. Um, so that's why I like to do it together. Yeah. When you do it together, do you talk with both of them week by week or one person, one week, one week, person, the next, how, how do you work that? Uh, and again, it's dependent on what their goals are and how long they've worked together. I do do separate sessions with each of them and then I bring them together for certain exercises. We usually start together so that we're all on the same page as far as roles and goals. Uh, and so the first couple of sessions are together because we want to make sure that we're, we're tight as to where we're going. What is the destination here? And then I usually will split them apart and help the executive assistant build her, his or her skill set help the executive build his or her skill set, and then how do you work together with that? And that's communications training, that's uh, recognition and validation, that is um, how do you use content or context? How do you actually speak with this person? What are the systems that you're using? All of it. Yeah, this is very consistent with what we do, although we don't focus in this particular niche. And do you have some stories of people of before and after type of stories so people can really understand, comprehend the impact this can have? Because I'm thinking of different numbers. I'm thinking of how many hours a week this might be saving or lower stress levels or whatever. But do you have some specific stories you can give us where they can kind of understand it before and after? Sure. Uh, so I was, uh, this was very recent. This was towards the end uh, yeah, towards the end of last year, before <laughs> before everything shut down and went went belly up, but um, I was working with uh, the executive was actually the person who came to me, which is fairly rare. It's usually the executive assistant who comes to me and says we need help, but the executive came to me and said I've been working with my assistant for I want to say it was about a year, um, and it's just not working, and I I need some help. I need some help getting the relationship going. So through a few calls. Um, it was very clear to me that this was not the assistant that he needed. Uh, she was not a bad person. She just did not fit what he needed. So after a certain set of calls, I had a very honest conversation with him. And I said, you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. And I know you like her as a human, but she's not what you need. And you, we're, we were going to need to let her go and find you somebody else. And he was like, what? I thought she was perfect. I mean, she's got the skill set that we need. And I said, that's great, but she doesn't have your values. She's, you know, the, they just had very different value sets and there was constant strife about the value set. Uh, so we, we did um, very respectfully and wonderfully uh, help her find another position, help the, the 
EA find another position. And then I helped him hire someone who actually fit. And then once we did that, I was able to come in and actually start from the beginning and work with him on how does he communicate the tasks that he needs done with her. And we worked a lot with how he could offer context instead of just content, just telling her to do a thing, give her the reason that you think needs to happen. And who cares about the route that she takes in order to get there? Um, what the executive does not need to know is the route that they take. You, you're you paying her for a outcome. You're not paying her to make sure she does the route, how you would do the route. Because the whole point of it is for them to do it differently, smarter, faster, easier than you. And once we did that, almost immediately, his body language, I would even see in our Zoom calls, the body language went from... Uh, from heaviness, how, you know, because he was not only having the weight of having to run an entire company, but how he was having the weight of, of how to have this partnership that wasn't working. So we eliminated one of the big weights and he could really then focus on actually running a business, which is what he's supposed to do. So we got him to that point. It took, I was working with them for about six months, I think it was, it was end to end was about six months. And by the end of it, um, she was coming on the calls with me and saying, well, uh, we're, una you know, he was unable to join the call today, but we talk so much and we have a system in place that you can tell me anything you need and I can get, I can relay the message back to him. Uh, and I did check in with him. She's still, she's still there. This has been about a year. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's I great. could just see, you know, again, the, the real outcome of this is the executive or entrepreneur being able to do and focus on what they need to do in order to move the company forward. That is the job of the entrepreneur, the executive is to see everything from above the forest and help bring uh, the company forward. You know, they don't have to worry about the details. Yeah. I think that's a great example. Now, correct me if I'm wrong or, or because it seems like that type of relationship had to give that executive at least an hour a day back in, in his schedule. Oh, I mean, we're looking at 10 hours, at least 10 hours a week. She took off of his plate and yeah. by the end of it, again, she, you know, the, the goal is uh, for me anyway. Um, and one of the, the turning points in my career with Simon was there's, there's a point where, sort of the executive has is holding on to the assistant who's behind them and they're sort of pulling him or her along with her, giving them tasks. And the weight is on the executive to, to hold the weight of the person behind them and, and have to manage that whole uh, relationship. The goal is to get the assistant out in front of the executive. So the assistant is the one uh, on top, so to speak, saying this is what needs to happen. And then the assistant's the one pulling the executive. So they can just sit back and go, okay, I can just focus on what I need to focus on today. So it's, it's not only saving time, it's saving energy. It's saving a whole lot of energy. And then you don't have to be squeezed and do things that you don't want to do, that you don't like to do, that you don't have to do. More than 25% of entrepreneurs' job is doing the crap that they hate to do. So let's get rid of that and take 25% of your life back. Oh, yeah. That's, I think that's awesome. So it makes perfect sense. And you think about it, <clears throat> here you are investing in this person to support a critical resource. Notice I'm not saying necessarily the top resource because I don't like to single one person out. But when you look mm -hmm. at a Steve Jobs or you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, they are very unique. When they're gone, it's not the same. But here you, you're taking an assistant to someone who's a critical resource and really freeing them up to do their best. I'd like to go back to one of your comments. You said that the initial assistant that he had was not a good values match. Can you talk about that and how to make certain, I, you, know, you know me, we, we're working on my hiring talk. I'm big on mm -hmm. matching this stuff in the hiring process. Can you talk about some tips on how people can do that when they're hiring someone and also to, to step back, maybe lose some emotion when you have a relationship that's not working, it's not always mm -hmm. just an executive assistant, but you're right. one that's not working. Just look at, do we have a values mismatch here or something? So talk, please talk about that a bit. Absolutely. I think we, we are on the same page when it comes to values. And that is one of the most important things um, that you should look for when hiring someone. Skills can be taught. 
just because someone knows how to use Microsoft Office does not mean they're going to be a great executive assistant. Uh, there is a certain personality set that does go along with being an assistant or wanting an assistant, but um, without having a basis of values, um, it, it's, there, there's going to be strife and you're going to get into something. And so the values is both big and small. You as a human have lots of big values that you, um, that you uh, associate with. Integrity, honesty, honor, um, family values. There could be some really big major values that if they're not symbiotic, there's going to be strife. Even something like family values, even something that might seemingly be very simple, uh, but if you're a family man and every single day you are home for dinner every single night, you leave the office at five o'clock so that you can spend time with your family and you have an executive assistant who doesn't have a family, they're 22 years old, they don't, and I'm not giving any, I'm not saying anything towards 22 year olds, <laughs> you don't have to email me after this and yell at me, but um and does not have a family and does not understand that. And maybe they're a night person and you're a morning person. Well, you're gonna have strife because you're gonna be raring to go at 7 a.m. They're gonna be raring to go at 7 p.m. You're gonna be there, you're gonna wanna leave the office every day when they're just getting started. And so there's gonna be some mismatch in there. So when you can identify what your values are as a person, not only you as a person, but the company that you've created, and then Find someone that either shares in those values or at least understands them. Um, if your value is healthy mind, body, spirit, and you have an executive assistant candidate in front of you that is perfect in every way, shape, or form, and after the interview, they say, I'm going to go outside and have a smoke, whether or not you hire them or not is fine, but you have a data point. And that's a data point that you need to pay attention to. And so all I, all I say is you need to pay attention to this and the bigger values are, are going to be more important. Now, I hesitate to bring this up, but I'd like to go into to, um, one of the dangers of having a, an, a, an exec, executive assistant relationship between male and female, and mm -hmm. it starts to get too personal. Mm -hmm. So how do you protect against that? Because here you need to basically have this executive assistant. And, I, and I've had that type of person um, before where it, it was a friendship, not a close mm -hmm. friendship, but it was a friendship as well. as I just totally trusted this person. I didn't fully know how to work with her, you know, but, but she was awesome. She was ready to do anything. How do you make certain you don't cross a line? Because we have so many people who are struggling in life and struggling in relationships mm -hmm. in their home, mm -hmm. in their personal life. Mm -hmm. And how do you structure it so they avoid getting tempting, tempted to get into something that's gonna, gonna cause them even more strife? Sure. Well, you know, we're humans and humans are messy and human relationships are really <laughs> messy. And I think at the end of the day, between people and between humans, um, if something calls to you, people act on things. I, I guess that's what I'm just trying to say. People act on things. So uh, the, the point of this is, you know, when, when starting off a relationship with someone, um, if you're in the hiring phase and this person immediately sits down and you immediately look at them and you go, wow, I want to date her. Don't hire her. Don't hire that person. <laughs> yeah. If you want to date her. That's a big her, red flag. Then, that's a big red flag. If in the first initial meeting you're looking at them and you're like, God, you fit all of my, uh, you know, requirements of a partner. I really want to date you. Maybe if I just hire you, this can be the way to go. No, no. Say, this has been great. I can't hire you right now, but I would love to ask you out for dinner on Saturday. Let's just be honest and say the thing that's on our brains and, and yeah. use our language for what we need to. So that's my first tip. Um, you know, the relationship between an executive and the assistant should be very personal. It should be like a friendship. Um, Simon and I used to call each other brother and sister. Like he was absolutely a brother to me. I would have given him a, a kidney. I would have taken my kidney out with a spoon to give it to him. He <laughs> meant that much to me. And we were often mistaken for being a couple. Uh, actually, it was more on my side where people would say to me, oh, you must be his wife or you must be his girlfriend. Because apparently there was no capacity in which a woman would be standing next to such a prominent speaker if I wasn't, you know, his girlfriend or wife. 
that's a different podcast. But uh, so the relationship should be tight. You should be able to speak to someone. You should be able to go into your executive's office and say, I feel terrible. Something happened with my family. Uh, my boyfriend broke up with me. My, you know, uh, whatever it might be, you, you need, this is human stuff. This is human relationships. You have to be able to do that. Um, then if somewhere in between there, there starts to become something more and you feel uh, an electricity that goes beyond that. My recommendation would be be honest, have a conversation. Don't hide it. Don't sit down with this person and say, this is where I'm at. What do we want to do? Because if they're feeling something, the other person is probably feeling something and you can just have an honest conversation about it. And whether or not you move forward with it, that's what you need to do as a human. And um, I wouldn't necessarily say that you just have to say that's off limits, but I would say that's off limits if you're gonna continue working in that capacity. It's very hard to become uh, a very powerful executive assistant if you are in a relationship with the executive, like a physical relationship. It's possible and it happens, um, but at the, the basis of all of this is honesty, honesty and respect. And it's all, yeah. all relationships come down to is honesty and respect. Um, but, you know, hiding it or, um, and this is obviously has nothing to do with acting inappropriate because that's completely a different conversation and, and uncalled for. And we as human beings all know what that is. We do. Whether yeah. or not you think you do and you say, I didn't know that me um, slapping him or her on the butt was, was offensive. Yes, you did. I'm sorry. Yes, you do. <laughs> so if you even consider it in your brain as it's offensive, don't do it. Yeah. I, I, I remember when I was working on one of our charm school courses um, on etiquette or something like that. Um, or it was one, maybe it was one of the other ones, but I remember a woman commented to me that she had a, a man who was in a leadership role, walk up and touch her pregnant belly. No ask, with the ask would be inappropriate, but to just do it was totally inappropriate. And the guy was totally clueless um, yep. or he had been yep. told and didn't want to pay attention to it. So right. I think if you think you it's know. inappropriate, either don't do it or ask if you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if I think they say no, respect, <laughs> respect that. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I think the other component is, as you say, if you get into a working relationship, you didn't pick it up necessarily in the interview. Did you get into a working relationship and you start to have some feelings or whatever? And if you can catch those in the beginning and avoid yeah. tempting situations, and then it kind of goes back to your values and the values of the boss. If, you, exactly. if those are in sync, then you may have to make a decision on your own to depart. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that can be the boss departing. Um, and that's not that the executive assistant has to take the blow. You can have a conversation, you, you know, whatever way you want to do it, but, but don't let it stumble into something that, that I'm going to mm -hmm. word it differently. Um, stumble into something where you're violating those values that Absolutely. you have in common, because that's, what's going to hurt you is, Absolutely. Oh, I knew what to do and I didn't do it. And now I'm here. And this is a much more confusing place to be in mm -hmm. that I didn't want to be in. Yeah. And, um, you know, so, so I think it's, Gut it's good and for people to be aware of that. You know, it's so interesting. I find with my executive coaching clients, they, they listen to their gut and their instinct when it comes to business a lot. I know this is the direction I need to go down. I know this is the product that I need to put into the world. They, they, re they rely on their intuition for that. But when it comes to interpersonal relationships with anyone in their office, let alone their executive assistant, they, they tend to forget that. They tend to not pay attention to their gut and their intuition that tells them either how they need to react and relate to someone or what is too much for that person. And so I say use the same intuition you have for running your business with and, and, and apply that much time and energy and respect onto your relationships with your people, and that will change the face of your business. If you can apply as much time as you spend on the business with your, as you do on your people, it's a game changer. Yeah. Yeah. So as we move towards closing this out, I'm curious, you have been working with a variety of people across a number of industries, worked with great people like, like Simon. And as you look at this situation where a lot of entrepreneurs have pivoted 
and they're making moves and coming out of this pandemic with, you know, a different business flavor type of thing. You also have some that have had to shut their businesses and they have to make a decision. Do I reopen and take on debt, which many of them don't want to do because they have a value of no debt or do I shut down, wait a little bit and then restart something else or the same thing without the debt, you know, whatever, I don't know. What, what advice would you have for people based on the conversations you've been having over the last couple of months? Oh, wow. Um, Just a small question to close it out. Small question. Yeah. Small question to close <laughs> it out. What should people do with their future? So, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that this, we've all had to make very serious decisions in the last six months. And we, I think as a society has grown and evolved, I want to believe that this whole pandemic was uh, one of the results of it will be that we as human people will evolve to our next level and we will become a better version of ourselves. And so I'm hoping during this time, whether you've had to close your business, whether you're not sure what to do, that you have um, understood what's really important in your life and understood what's important in your world and will stay, um, stay focused on that. If you, you know, were a workaholic and you were 80 hours a week working and now all of a sudden the last six months you've had time to spend with your family and you've been home and you're enjoying it and you like watching your kids go off to school. Well, you're, the new version of your business that you create is going to be very different. You're not going to be able to work 80 hours a week and you don't want to work 80 hours a week. So I would say spend some time thinking about what this isolation and what this pandemic has done for you in a positive way. We can all spend oodles of time seeing what this did in a negative way, but let's focus on how you have grown, what you have seen, what is a new perspective that you have now that you did not have in February. We've all figured something out in the last eight weeks. And that could be, I hate to stay at home. It could be something that little. Then you know that <laughs> yeah. your next job, you have to get out of the house and you need a job where you can go into an office and working from home is not your bag. Um, it could be as simple as that. So I would say, look at what you've learned and apply that to the life that you had before and build the new life that you want. We have the opportunity now to not work out of obligation. We can work purposefully now. So how, what is that? Whatever that means to you, I think that's how you should move forward. Kind of a general answer, but I hope that's what you were looking for. Actually, Monique, I, I don't think that's a, a general comment. I think you're relating back to the values you brought up earlier, that people need to have strong values. They need to connect with the people they work with. And now you're going back to the individual and you're saying, hey, you learned something you, that connected with your personal values, maybe something you were so hard charging you were missing before. And you're encouraging people to have courage. Yep. And really incorporate that into their next career step, their next career move, what they might do in their business. I mean, maybe you're a business person who lost some people due to COVID mm -hmm. or who had employees who lost somebody. And so maybe you got a little wake up call and that you care about people more than you thought, or you need Absolutely. to spend more time in that area. So I think it's great advice. Yeah, so, we... We tend to avoid looking within because it's hard and it's painful sometimes and it's messy and we actually have to do work in order to change. Um, one of the things that I always say is uh, as entrepreneurs and as business owners, we talk about change as if it's this thing that other people do and we get a reaction from it. And uh, we, you know, we say change management and change the face of business and change, change, change. But as individuals, we are not very willing to change as humans. We want to stand in our ground. And yet again, organizations are made up of humans. So if individually we're not willing to change, but yet we want the organization to change, there's no way to go about that. So when you look within yourself, yes, it's hard. Yes, it's messy. Yes, it'll be uncomfortable. But without having that first step, um, you could probably just go back to the life that you had. Everyone's been talking about how do we return to normal? And I challenge everyone that says that to me and says, do you want to go back to that? Like think of who you were October, November, December, 
Is that the person that you want to go back to? Do you feel like you were everything that you needed to be then? And the answer could be yes. And that's great if so. And I usually get, well, oh, no, I probably could do a little bit better with my friendships or I could probably eat better or exercise more or I could probably work less, whatever it might be. I said, well, then don't return to normal, please. Go to something, walk towards the person you want to be. Don't keep trying to look backwards and, and make sure that you could fit back into the old box. Awesome. I think that's a great place to close. Monique, as always, it's a joy to talk with you. You're great. And uh, we did direct people on how to reach you at moniquehelstrom.com. And we'll have that on the podcast. And it's, it's great to be with you. I look forward to being coached by you in the months ahead. I look forward to it as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs>